You may have met a certain other scientist downstairs did, as you came in. Did you meet him? He's quite easy to identify, isn't he, with the hair and the surface. I'm, I'm less easy to identify. You, you may recognise me, Arthur Enzi. I'm, I'm an astronomer, I'm a physicist and a mathematician. In fact, I'm obsessed by numbers, and uh, I'll tell you more about that later. In fact, if you want to ask me about the Eddington number for cycling at the end, I can tell you about that as well. That's just on the side. But um, let me just tell you, I, I, I went to Cambridge, I taught in Cambridge, I came down to the uh, Greenwich Observatory where I was the chief assistant, I went back to Cambridge, I was charge there, and I came here. And in 1914, I was working here, and of course you all know what happened in 1914. Also, something else happened. As the secretary of this society, I was in touch with a certain other scientist who you've already met. But the problem was, of course, in the Great War, if a theory was German, it wouldn't go down terribly well in Britain. And that was the case. Now, luckily, science has no boundaries. And a friend of mine, Willem de Sitter, in Holland, which is neutral, of course, or was, um, was able to contact Albert Einstein and vice versa. So any information came to me. Now, you all, I'll take this for granted, because you all understand where it is. Do you? Yeah. Um, um, perhaps one or two of you don't, just one or two. Could I just indulge in a, little ex a thought experiment here, just because this explains what I'm then going to explain we did. Um, I've got a board here, I um, hope you can see it. Um, let me just get a pen, here we are. Um, this is what Einstein's general theory of relativity tells us, in a sort of um, theoretical kind of way. Let's imagine we're all in this room, which is not difficult because we are indeed all in this room, but let's imagine we've always been here. This is our entire life. There are no windows. We've been sealed in here, but it's quite pleasant. In fact, we're so far away from any great mass of anything that we can float around. So this wall here, and this wall here, and this wall here are all the same. We can use all the space. It's wonderful. Here we are, inside our room. Now, as far as we're concerned, everything's normal. We'll just check a couple of things, though. I'm sure you all know that light, of course, has a, 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 the same speed, always, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So we'll check that, and we'll, we'll shine a little torch on that little one here. Uh, there we are, turn it on, excellent. Shine that little wall over there, marvelous. Uh, and of course, yes, that, I think you'll all agree that took the right time, speed of light, we've got that, and we'll try that now and then, yes. And of course, it goes in a straight line. We always know light travels in a straight line. That's fine. But what we don't know is that this room of ours, the outside of which we can't see, has always had a great big engine stuck underneath it. So there it is. Uh, we didn't know about it because it's under there somewhere. Until the day that I clumsily float around the room and, and hit the switch somewhere. The hot gas flies out this way. And of course, Newtonian physics tells us all that we are all going to go this way. But we don't know what's going on out here. All we know is that suddenly our wonderful world has changed. Instead of being able to float around everywhere and enjoy this lovely space, we're now stuck with this one here, this wall here, which needs a new name. We call it floor. So we call that one the ceiling, which we can't get to anymore. That's really annoying. And this force that suddenly appeared, which we can't explain, we'll call that something, we'll call it gravity. There's a good name, gravitas. Yes, that makes sense, gravity. So gravity has suddenly appeared, and it seems to be sticking us to this thing here. Oh, we're going to do our uh, experiment again as well. I'll take out my uh, light and shine it across the room. There we are. No, bit of a change. Because, of course, what we don't know is we're going this way. As the light leaves the torch, the whole room is moving. So by the time it reaches the other side, it hits the wall down there. So as far as we're concerned, inside here, oh dear, not only has this force appeared, but at the very same moment that the force appeared, light seems to be bent, which we know is impossible. And also, of course, that bent course there, that curved course, is longer than the straight one, which means that time must also be changed. We've, we've seen changes in time, the speed of light, which something, everything's gone completely haywire. Well, of course, this is just a thought experiment. But the general theory of relativity says that in a gravitational field, light will appear to be bent. Uh, I said appear. That's a very important word, which I'll come back to later on. Um, gravity can do that, can it? Well, yes. Now, can we, dis can we, can we see that here on the Earth? No, of course we can't. Because here on the Earth, our gravitational field is very weak. If I take my torch here, there it is. Now, the entire world is pulling this, this huge Earth beneath me, is pulling it towards the centre of the Earth. 
And of course, I'm, I'm stronger than that. So this is a very weak gravitational field. But there is a place not too far away from here with a much stronger gravitational field. And that is, of course, the sun. And to give you an idea of how much greater it is, uh, if it were possible to stand there, which it was not, you would weigh 27,000 times more than you weigh at the present. So it's a 27,000 times more powerful field. That's getting there, isn't it? It's a bit better. So how does that help us? Well, here's an idea. If some light from a distant object were to travel close to the sun, then the sun's gravitational field would appear to bend that light. Except, of course, you can't see light coming from anywhere else because the sun's brighter than that. Until you know that something's about to happen. Now, this brings me to what we were planning throughout the Great War. We knew that there would be an eclipse in 1919. The date? Well, it's today. 1919. What does that mean? Well, I, I can, I, I've got the perfect <coughs> experimental apparatus here, which is a piece of string. Uh, this will demonstrate what I'm talking about. Um, if I just take one end of it, somebody like to hold it. That's all you have to do, just hold one end of a piece of string. Thank you. There you go. Well done. That really is all you have to do. Uh, now, you, of course, are a star, and the light from you is radiating in all directions. And a little bit of it, a tiny bit, of course, is heading towards me here on the Earth with my telescope. And if I look up at the sky and you're in the right place, I can see you. There you are. Excellent. I can see you in relation to all the other stars in the sky. Marvellous. And that, of course, is light which has travelled to me over thousands of years in a straight line. Because it's light. We know that. Now, the day of the eclipse, um, something interesting happens. Because, of course, the sun can be here. And the light is travelling close to the sun, except now, with the moon shielding the sun from me, I can see the light from the star at the same time that the sun is in the sky. In other words, this light is travelling close to the gravitational field of the sun. What happens? I look through... Does that mean I just hold it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> that never happens in, in real experiments. <laughs> the star's dropped its light. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Would somebody else just... Do you mind standing here and holding on to this? Just one Thank you, sir. There you are. You, you are, in fact, now the sun, of course. And let's have it nice and taut. It's going to go in a straight line. That's it. Oh, that's it. Marvellous. Now, you see, if I look down the length of this piece of string, which is the light arriving at my telescope, I'm going to see the star, which is actually over there somewhere, over there, somewhere by the door, because it seems that the light from the star is curving around the sun. I'm exaggerating the amount, by the way. This is just for the... the uh, the demonstration. So now I'm seeing the star over there. Then of course, thank you very much, a few days later, thank you, the star's not there and the, you know, the same star is back where I thought it was compared to all the other stars. Thank you very much. Now if that was the case, we should be able to prove it. Professor Einstein never proves his theories, he leaves that to other people uh, and I'm that person being a friend of course. Easier said than done. Imagine years of preparation all the theory, all the equipment, all the equipment being tested, all the stuff you have to take with you. And you have to take it where? Well, to this island here, just off the African coast, Principe, there. And another expedition, Subrale, there in, in Brazil. Once you've got it there, you build the equipment up. You build the sheds to put the equipment in. All of that has to be tested. You have to allow for all the differences in what's there and what's here. And then you wait for the day of the eclipse, and you know what it's going to be. And the day dawns, and you know in an hour or so, you're going to see the eclipse. And to find that it's cloudy, of course, is the worst thing. If you're an astronomer, you know exactly the feeling. Everything you've done, everything is ready, but it's cloudy. And that's the way it remained, as the seconds ticked away, and we paced up and down, waiting for that moment, until just before the eclipse, the clouds parted, there was the sun with the moon in position, we could take the photograph, we had the plate. Now, of course, we could compare that to the previous plate. And on, in fact, here's a newspaper from the 7th of November reporting what happened on the 6th of November just here, the Royal Society, where the announcement was made to confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity. There was a slight difference in the position of the star due to gravitational lensing, as it was now called it. But in other words, the light had travelled close to the sun. Uh, oh, now this does bring me back to one slight problem then. Um, I did say light always travels in a straight line. Well, it does. So you might think, well, what's all this about then? Well, actually, the light does travel in a straight line, and in fact, it's the space itself that is curved. 
light travelling in a straight line through curved space, which uh, I've always said, if you think you can imagine that, you're wrong, because none of us can imagine. We're human beings, we live on the earth, we never see this effect. But to give an idea, somebody suggested this to me the other day, and as a keen cyclist, I rather like it. Imagine you're on a velodrome, and you're on your bicycle looking down at the line that's painted on the velodrome. Your sole focus is that line which you're going to follow, and you're cycling at high speed. Now, as far as you're concerned, you're just cycling along, following that line. There's no need for any input, no leaning, no steering. You're just following the line. But of course, the velodrome is curved. So what you're seeing is not what anybody on the outside would see, which is a bicycle going round and round in a circle, following that line, like light traveling in a straight line through curved space. Of course, quite hysterical. Um, some people, well, at the end of this, um, this meeting, um, people came up to me, of course, and they were quite complimentary. And uh, uh, one particular professor, Ludwig Silverstein, came up and he said, uh, Ah, Professor Eddington, you must be so proud. And I, I hesitated for a moment, and he said, well, You must be one of three people in the world who really understands relativity. And I said, Well, um, and he thought that I was perhaps being a little shy. He said, Don't be shy, Professor. I said, Oh, no, 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 it's not, it's not that. I'm, I'm just trying to think who the third person might be. Because, of course, I thought it was himself. Yes. But I'm pleased to say Professor Einstein said that my explanation was the best that he'd ever read, so I probably did understand it. And that was the proof. And here's the very important thing about that to remember. 1919, the end of the Great War, a German theory proved by an English expedition, which had quite an effect on the world, not just on science, but generally. Now, that's my story, and um, if anyone wants to come and talk to me, I'm going to be hanging around here. There are wonderful things to see. You'll see some beautiful illustrations, hand painted, previous eclipse expeditions, and so on. Uh, have a look at the positions of the places where we uh, observe the actual images over there, the minutes of the meeting of the um, eclipse committee over there, um, a demonstration over here. <laughs> This is Lucinda, who's going to demonstrate gravitational lensing, because you can see that there. Um, oh, what else have we got? Lots of things, haven't we, Sean? Sean. Are you sure? Um, so take a look at all of this. Come talk to me. Talk to all our, my friends here. And, oh, the Eddington number for cycling. I did mention that. It does exist. You can all have it, because I, uh, numbers are an important thing to me, as I said. My number is 84. What does that mean? It means that on 84 occasions, I have cycled 84 miles. So you can see how yours could work. Talk to me about that too. Thank you for coming along. Enjoy the rest of this time in the library. Thank you.